This is Morning Prayers at St. Peter's, Ipswich, brought to you online, a place where we study God's Word together and where we join our hearts and our voices before the throne of God, praying for the needs of our world, our church and ourselves. Welcome this morning. A very good morning to everyone gathered together in the Lord's name on this Tuesday, the 18th of July, 2023. Begin with an opening prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, accompany us in this day's journey. Dawn in our darkness, open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue in an attitude of prayer with a time of confession. This prayer of confession is based on a prayer from Iona Abbey. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, in the light of your risen presence and in union with your first frail apostles, we say sorry for not weighing your words, for not sharing your trials, for not believing your promises. O loving Christ hanged on a tree, yet risen in the morning, scatter the sin from our souls as the mist from the hills. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Holy Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Now today in the Church of England calendar, we remember Elizabeth Farrard, born the 22nd of February, 1825. After her mother died, she travelled to Germany, where a new order of deaconesses had been formed at Kaiserwerth for nursing and for teaching. On her return to England, she established the North London Deaconesses Institution near King's Cross. The then Bishop of London, Bishop Tate, later to become Archbishop of Canterbury, laid hands on her to become the first deaconess in England. She retired in 1870 because of ill health, but later ran a convalescent home in Redhill. In 1987, the order of deaconess was closed because women were allowed to become deacon and subsequently priest in 1994 and then bishop in 2015. One wonders what Elizabeth would have made of these developments of women's ministry, for which she blazed an early trail. We pray the collect for Elizabeth Ferrard. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have surrounded us with a great cloud of witnesses. Grant that we, encouraged by the good example of your servant Elizabeth Ferrard, may persevere in running the race that is set before us until at last we may attain with her to your eternal glory, joy. Through Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The psalm for us this morning is Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jah. 
Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship as his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. One of your descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons shall sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions, her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people shall ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David, and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head shall be adorned with a radiant crown. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Sorry about that. Just get in pace. Next reading. Many homes, particularly in Eastern Europe, you'll find in the corner of the living room a shrine to Mary or to Jesus, with sometimes a perpetual light, a place for the presence of God to be always visible in the home. I often wonder whether anyone would know that we were a Christian when they walk into our homes, when they see the books, or crosses dotted around our rooms. Here in this psalm, David is determined to find a place for the Ark of the Covenant. He chooses Jerusalem where the Ark will dwell. Actually, you will see in verse 13 that God chose Jerusalem. The tradition of a perpetual light you often see in Catholic churches is probably based on verse 17. Here I will set up a lamp for my anointed one. Your Old Testament reading is from the book of Esther, chapter 5. That's Esther, chapter 5. Esther's request to the king. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther entering, standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of his scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. So they were drinking wine. The king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favour, and if he pleases the king to grant my petition, and fulfil my request, 
Let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Sir Ashley's wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honoured honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction, so long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a pole set up, reaching to the height of fifty cubits, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here Esther continues her plans to save the Jews from the king's edict, no doubt guided by her guardian Mordecai. She enters the presence of King Xerxes, but respectfully waits for the king to invite her in, offering his scepter for her to touch. A certain sign she was welcome to present her petition or cause to the king. A simple request is for the king and Haman to come to a banquet she will prepare. On receiving his invitation, Haman is boastful to his friends and to his wife Zeresh. But Haman is still incensed by Mordecai's refusal to kneel down and pay him homage. His wife and his friends suggest to Haman to build a gallows and have Mordecai hanged in the morning. Pride is strongly evident in Haman's life, and as we shall see later, it blinded him to events which led to him being hanged on a gallows meant for Mordecai. So, Lord, we pray that we ourselves will not think so highly of ourselves so as not to see the larger picture that is going on around us. Amen. New Testament reading continue in the second book of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 7, from verse 2. That's 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, from verse 2. Paul's joy over the church's repentance. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We've exploited no one. I do not say this to you to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles and joy knows no bounds. For when we come, for when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. 
when you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was, because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had posted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I can have complete confidence in you. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My first wife's mother, a godly Christian, was prone to writing to her sons if they upset her in any way, rather than discuss matters face to face. Her concerns were usually valid and usually positively received by her sons and acted upon. In a similar way, Paul does not regret writing his first letter to the Corinthians, as some scholars think it was a separate letter than the two which are in the New Testament. Even if they were upset for a while, they later accepted Paul's criticism and repented, which caused Paul great joy when Titus reported back to him. Paul confronted the Corinthian Christians, but he did not condemn them. It is possible to confront without condemning, though those who are being confronted rarely think so. He encourages them firstly to be sorry, sorry for their sins, then secondly to repent, seeking God's forgiveness. Peter the disciple was sorry for denying Jesus, but repented later. Judas was not sorry for betraying Jesus, then died. Paul sends Titus to Corinth and he seems to have been successful in smoothing over the misunderstandings in the Corinthian church, which delights Paul, and he ends up declaring complete confidence in them. So we pray for godly discernment whenever we feel moved to confront anyone so as to use the right loving words, seeking a favourable outcome. Amen. Turn now to our time of prayer and the response the Lord hear us is Lord graciously hear us. So let us pray. As we pray for the church this morning, we pray a blessing on the Worcestershire Seven parishes of St. James's Hartlebury. We pray for new opportunities in the village and with the school and also the future of the Mission Church at Crossways Green. Bless their clergy, Stephen Winter, together with their LLMs, James Horner, Richard Jaynes, Marjorie Workman, and Richard Berry. Heavenly Father, bless the ministry of Bishop Shannon McVean Brown in the Diocese of Vermont in the USA. Bless it to home, Lord, would you uphold and empower our bishops, John and Martin, together with our parish clergy, 
Darth Ian and Paul. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And some verses from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Heavenly Father, grant wisdom to our Prime Minister Richard Sunak and his ministers as they seek ways forward to minimise the economic crisis in order to prove, improve the lives of many who are having to resort to food banks and social benefits to survive. Also, may measures be taken to improve the national health system so staff and patients will regain confidence in the system. And we pray against trade unions seeking wage increases, which would inevitably increase the cost of living. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we intercede for people whose poor mental health means they're considering suicide. Please guide them and their families to reach out to a doctor, helplines and other services for the emotional, practical and medical help they need. And we pray particularly for so many farmers on the brink of suicide because of changes in benefits and poor prices for their livestock. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, protect the thousands of people suffering loss of homes and livelihoods through the floods in South Korea. With record temperatures in Greece and the USA, give wisdom to their people to be sensible and avoid being outdoors whenever possible. And we pray that all governments will heal yet more evidence of global warming. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We now pray for all known to us who are suffering in one way or another, whether from short-term illnesses, recovering from operations, or struggling with long-term conditions. And we particularly pray for Garth's mother, who is very unwell at this moment. So restore them, Lord, together with those mentioned in our newsletter, The Catch, to full health and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Comfort all who grieve the loss of a loved one at this time. Heavenly Father, grant them comfort and peace at this difficult time. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And as our Saviour taught his disciples, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So a final blessing. Heavenly Father, give us grace to follow your saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us, and those whom we love, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining with me this morning. And God willing, you'll join Garth for tomorrow's prayer time at 10 o'clock. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>